Hi everyone, we are doing this chemistry paper today. This is 9701, paper 52, May June 2023. The time is 1 hour 15 minutes. I also plan to do physics paper 5 as well as chemistry and physics paper 4 soon. I'll be uploading them uh, before October or uh, within the month of October, hopefully. All right? Uh, since we're having weekly uploads now. And yeah, the channel is also going to expand to all levels content starting next week, so I'm super excited for that. We have some new tutors joining who are gonna help me throughout the process. Also, before we begin, let's take a look at the threshold. And if you guys do like the videos, please like this video and consider subscribing to the channel, as well as supporting me on Patreon. As you can see, there are three tiers currently. We have the first tier, which is just for support. The second tier, which is $5, where you get access to ad-free videos, requests for question paper solving, as well as access to my chapter-wise notes for physics and chemistry, AS and A2 both, as well as access to all my solved question papers, the recent years, for uh, chemistry P5, P4, P1, and P2, same for physics and bio, as well as S1, P3, P1, and M1. Uh, this is honestly an offer that you can't miss since you're getting access to so many things. Also, uh, for the $15 tier, you get access to video calls with me once or twice a month where we discuss your problem separately, as well as your name in the credits on screen on my YouTube videos, as well as access to some private videos, which are currently being worked out as well as access to all my solve papers starting from 2002 to 2023 so yeah please do consider supporting me here if you do like the content without further ado let's begin so for the threshold uh paper 5g right a was at 21 b was at 18 c was at 15 d was at 13 and e was at 10 so relatively, the paper was easier compared to paper 5.1, yeah? So yeah, if you do uh, support me on Patreon, you get access to all of these. I have all of these solved, P4 and P5. Let's begin. So the full mark is 50. And sorry this is p5 full mark is 30 a was at 21 b was at 18 c was at 15 d was at 13 and e was at 10 all right and a star should be at around since you see a gap of three marks in between 24 a star is probably at 24 so if you uh give this paper as an exam and match with the mark scheme if you do get 24 you're good to go you're gonna get a star in the main exam hopefully so let's begin starting with question number one i actually have this question done so it's gonna be a faster process to do this okay so three students are asked to prepare samples of benzoic acid from the alkaline hydrolysis of methyl benzoic. So we know that methyl benzoic, this is the compound, this is methyl benzoic. It is an ester which has two components, the acid part and the alcohol part. The alcohol part is methanol and the acid part is benzoic acid. So if we perform acid hydrolysis, we would have, we would get basically benzoic acid and methanol. But since we've performed alkaline hydrolysis, this is the key point, we are going to get uh, methanol, but the salt of benzoic acid, which is sodium benzoate. Okay. As a result, we get sodium benzoate, which has to be further acidified with HCl to form benzoic acid so we are just taking an extra step all right so we have methyl benzoate 
which is being hydrolyzed using an alkali NaOH, which results in methanol and sodium benzoate, followed by acidification to form benzoic acid. All right. Now, the student uses the following procedure. Um, essentially, we have 1.242 grams of liquid methyl benzoate. We put it into a 50 cm cube round bottom flask. Now, we prepare 100 cm cube of the 1 mole per dm cube aqueous sodium hydroxide solution for hydrolysis okay and then we add 10 cm cube of this excess into the round bottom flask so the sodium hydroxide that we're using is an excess so i'm going to teach you three things uh, for measurements we are always going to use a burette if it's an excess volume we can use a measuring cylinder so if it's for all volumes to measure, we're going to use a burette, and particularly for um, excess volumes, we can use a measuring cylinder. And whenever we transfer any volume between two containers, we're going to use a pipette. So now we add some anti bumping granules to the round bottom flask. What are anti bumping granules? They are basically like beads, they are also called boiling chips. Uh, you know that when water boils, there are some bubbles, right? So to prevent this violent boiling we use the these anti-bumping granules so we fit a condenser to make reflux apparatus reflux the reaction mixture for 20 minutes now you guys need to understand that uh, when is reflux used basically it's a form of heating so it increases rate of reaction but mainly for volatile reagents because the uh, reaction might occur at 70 degrees Celsius but you know the substances okay the substances may boil at 50 degrees celsius okay the reaction may occur at 70 degrees celsius but the substances may boil at 50 degrees celsius so if you do not use or heat it in a sealed container what might happen your reagents might evaporate even before your reagents may evaporate even before the reaction takes place so we won't get any products since our reagents have evaporated so to prevent this from happening we use a reflux we use a reflux apparatus which keeps the volatile components within the container now we allow the reaction mixture to cool and pour it into a beaker acidify it with dilute hcl filter the mixture and then purify the benzoic acid by recrystallization from hot water okay so let's move on calculate the volume of methyl benzoate used in step one we have the density of methyl benzoate at 1.08 into uh, grams per cm cube we also have the mass. We know that density equals to mass by volume. So volume is equal to mass by density. So volume equals to mass by density. So the mass is 1.242 and the density is 1.08. So we are ending up with an answer of 1.15 cm cube exactly. Since they wanted the answer to 0 0.05 cm cube, that's fine. So if we got something like 1.18, we would give the answer to 1.20, something like that, okay? That is all. Now, let's move on to the next part. Identify a suitable piece of apparatus to measure the volume of methyl benzoate. So I told you the answer will always be red, but we need to check whether it's an excess. So this volume over here, 1.15, this is an exact volume, right? So to measure any exact volume, we are going to prefer a burette. And if they asked us to find out the volume of NaOH, it's an excess, right? What would we use to measure that? We would go for a measuring cylinder, all right? Now, calculate the mass of NaOH that is needed to prepare the solution in step two. So we want to prepare this solution, all right? So we know that moles equals to volume into concentration. So we can find that out. Moles equals to volume into concentration. The volume is 100 cm cube, which is 100 by 1000 dm cube. And the concentration is one mole per dm cube, yeah? So, uh, we end up with 0 0.1 moles. Now, we know that the mass is equal to moles into MR. So, the moles is 0 0.1 and the MR is MR of NaOH. Uh, you have access to the data booklet over here. I mean the here. So, NaOH, right? So, sodium is 23. Then, oxygen is 16. And hydrogen is 1. So, that is uh, 17 plus 23 which is 40 in total so that is the MR of NaOH yeah? so NaOH 40 times 0 0.1 that gives you a value of 4.0 grams all right 
so we need 4.0 grams of NOH that's that now student 1 added the mass of NOH calculated into a beaker so they're asking us how would we prepare this solution so this is a really common question that you'll face in all the variants that you uh, do almost all variants solution preparation so remember we need three things for making a solution we need distilled water we obviously need the mass of solid required and yeah we need a beaker and a volumetric flask so which volumetric flask do we need for example in this question we are asked to make a 100 cm cube solution so we need a 100 cm cube volumetric flask if they asked us to make a 250 cm cube solution we'd go for a 250 cm cube volumetric flask it's as simple as that so at first we need to uh, you know put the 4 grams of NOH into a beaker and dissolve it in some distilled water next what do we do we are going to transfer it we are going to transfer this solution which has NH dissolved in it along with its washings by rinsing it into a volumetric flask and then we are going to top up with this water up to the mark okay so that is the series of steps that you need to know Dissolve the solid in the beaker using a small volume of distilled water, something like maybe 40 cm cube. I'm not using 100 cm cube, I'll tell you why. If I used 100 cm cube here, then I'd transfer 100. And then, you know, I if I transferred the whole thing, I need to transfer the washings as well, right? Suppose I transferred the whole thing. Now I have 100 cm cube here, but now some solid might stick to the edges, right? That's why I need to rinse it again with some distilled water so that I can transfer the washings to that solution. Then the volume would exceed 100 and it would turn into 110 or 120 and it would overflow, right? So that's the main issue that you're going to face. That is why you need to dissolve the solid in the beaker using a small volume of distilled water and then transfer the solution to a 100 cm cube volumetric flask and rinse you could also say instead of saying and rinse you could say transfer the solution with washings to a 100 cm cube volumetric flask and then top up to the mark with distilled water top up to the mark of the 100 cm cube volumetric flask with distilled water is that fine you will get this quite often this is a really common question now the student actually made a mistake let's see what mistake he or she has made student two uh he or she has actually prepared 0.1 mole per dm cube of noh rather than one mole per dm cube of noh so it is dilute by a factor of 10. state how this would affect the final mass of benzoic acid explain using calculations how you came to this conclusion all right let's do this so to solve this we actually need to take a look at the balanced chemical equation the stoichiometry is important over here so let's try to see what happens okay so what has happened is we've decreased the concentration of NaOH but kept the volume of, of NaOH the same so before it was an excess but now due to the lower concentration it might turn into the limiting reagent we have to keep that in mind so since i'm using the same volume but lower concentration the moles of NaOH will reduce but the moles of this remains the same <clears throat> okay for example let me show you the working we know that the moles of uh, methyl benzoate is what was it what is the moles of methyl benzoate we need the MR. The MR is given but I don't want to spoil things. I have the answer over here. So yeah, the MR of methyl benzoate is 136 and it's 122 for that. 136 and 122 over there. Okay, so we can do mass by MR which is 1.242 divided by MR 136. What do we get? Wait, let me use my calculator. 1.242 divided by 136, that gives you a value of 9.13 into 10 to the power minus 3. <clears throat> so that's the moles of methyl benzoate. On the other hand, NOH, the moles for NOH is now, since the concentration is 0.1 mole per dm cube, as it was written here, 0.1 mole per dm cube, the new concentration is 0.1 mole per dm cube. So what is the new concentration of NOH? 
0.1 by 1000 and we are using a value of 10 right 0.1 by 1000 into 10 cm cubes so 0.1 by 1000 times 10 0.1 times 1 th by 1000 times 10 that gives you a value of 1 into 10 to the power minus 3 so look at the previous scenario okay uh, this is the new one and what about the old one the old concentration of NOH was 1 mole per dm cube right that is what's mentioned over here it is 1 mole per dm cube so it's actually 1 times 10 by 1000 which gives you a value of 0 0.01 so this is the new one and the old one was 0 0.01 or 1 into 10 power minus 2 so beforehand um, NaOH was in fact the one in excess and methyl benzoate was in excess sorry was the limiting reagent but in the new scenario look at this the tables have turned now methyl benzoate is the limiting is the one in excess and NaOH is the limiting reagent and the limiting reagent has decreased in value as a result the moles of the salt will also decrease and since this decreases the moles of benzoic acid will also decrease and as a result the mass will also be lower okay so see if you guys get it before NaOH was in excess and methyl benzoate was a limiting reagent but now NaOH is the limiting reagent and we know that whenever we have a limiting reagent and something in excess we proceed with the math with the limiting reagent not the one in excess and since the value of the limiting reagent has decreased from 9.13 into 10 power minus 3 to 1 into 10 power minus 3 we have you know reached the conclusion that the moles of the final product will decrease so this is my working over here see if it matches and please do comment below if you have any queries so i find out the new moles of NH and i find out the moles of methyl benzoate at 9.13 to 10 power minus 3. so clearly now NOH is no longer in excess or we can say that NOH is the new limiting reagent so we have calculated the final mass of benzoic acid to be so I've proceeded with the limiting reagent uh, 0 0.122 <clears throat> so yeah this is the new mass of benzoic acid what about the older one if I proceeded with the old value of the limiting reagent back when NOH was in excess, I'd use 9.13 to 10 power minus 3. All of them have the same molar ratio, yeah? 1 is to 1 is to 1. So, yeah, this will also have 9.13 to 10 power minus 3. And if you want to find out the mass, the old mass, it would have been 9.13 to 10 power minus 3 times 122. Let's do that. Um... 1.242 divided by 136 times 122 that gives you a value of 1.11 this is the old mass 1.11 grams but now the new mass is 0 0.12 to see how much it has decreased okay so this is extremely important for you guys all right hopefully that makes sense the mass of benzoic acid decreases because NaOH is now the limiting reagent and you have to show the proper calculation explain using calculations that's what they mentioned okay now we're going to go to some theories so let's answer them accordingly why is it necessary to reflux the mixture in step 5 I already told you guys that reflux is typically used when we want to increase the rate of reaction for volatile reagents so that they don't get evaporated or they don't boil okay because typically the reaction temperature is higher than the boiling point of those reagents allows heating to increase the rate of the reaction without the loss of volatile substances explain why naked flame is not used in step 5 think about it we actually used a condenser to make reflux apparatus we did not allow direct contact of the naked flame with our reagents so typically this is a common question the answer is usually because the reagents are flammable so if they came in contact with um, a naked flame an explosion might have occurred all right so that's the logic substances are flammable <clears throat> explain the purpose of transferring the liquid in step six now this one was a rather a difficult one i haven't seen this question before this is the first time i'm seeing it so look at this we need to go through step six this is new and uh, check this allow the reaction mixture wait let me erase these i'm going to explain again 
Oh, this is, I think, the one for step nine. So as you can see in step six, what have they asked? Let's see. They've asked us, what is the purpose of, you know, transferring the liquid in step six? Step six, this one over here. Allow the reaction mixture to cool. So after we've heated it in the reflux apparatus, what do we have? <clears throat> add 10 cm cube of NH to the round bottom flask and add some anti-bumping -bump granules. I told you the boiling chips are used to prevent violent boiling to the round bottom flask. Now, um, the alkaline hydrolysis has occurred. We heat it to accelerate the reaction and reflux it for 20 minutes and we allow it to cool and carefully pour the liquid into the beaker. So complete hydrolysis has taken place. Now we have the alkaline salt of benzoic acid, sodium benzoate. Now we've just transferred it from a round bottom flask to a beaker after making it cool. So here we have cool sodium benzoate now why didn't we just add the dilute HCl uh, into the round bottom flask why did we have to transfer it to the beaker that's what they ask you so mainly because you know the round bottom flask also has the anti-bumping granules that we used in step four okay and the round bottom flask also has a very uh, narrow opening and it's uh, it has a long neck which makes it difficult for us to add the acid for proper you know, acidification of sodium benzoate and it would be difficult to stir as well so these are other reasons but mainly they have given priority to the point that uh, we need to get rid of the anti-bumping granules okay from the reaction mixture so this is the first time I've actually seen this point I haven't seen this before maybe I missed it in any other variant so let's move on to the next part um, explain what the student should do to confirm that this uh, mixture has been acidified in step 7. So yeah, in step 7, what have we done? In this beaker, we acidify it with diluted still. So now, how are we going to confirm that, yes, in fact, the solution has turned acidic from alkaline? Because the mixture might have some residual NaOH, right? Because the NaOH is in excess. So we need to add enough acid to titrate the NaOH, right? <clears throat> to completely neutralize it as well as acidify my salt. So typically to figure out whether it's acidic or not, we can simply use an indicator, an acid-base indicator, and then the color will tell us whether it's acidic or not. Uh, you might be thinking about a pH meter, but that's too complex. And litmus paper is typically used for uh, gaseous substances, and we just use an acid-base indicator for, you know, simple liquid solutions, okay? So we are going to use an acid-base indicator, uh, followed by, we, followed by the statement that the mixture will show the color for a strong acid, or just an acid in that particular indicator, okay? Really important points, you guys need to go through this, this is really important, okay? So let's go to the next one. Describe what you would expect to observe as the sodium benzoate mixture is acidified in step 7. Describe what you would expect to observe as the sodium benzoate mixture is acidified in step 7. So this acidify the liquid with dilute HCl. So what would we see? Typically our findings are any color changes, any gases evolving, or any solid being formed. So let's take a look at this step. When we acidify it, what happens to uh, sodium benzoate? It actually turns into benzoic acid, which is solid in nature. Okay, so what would we see? A precipitate would form. That is our statement. Okay, so yeah, if any gas was being formed, we would say, a gas evolves or basically we could say that you know precipitate uh, effervescence occurs effervescence occurs all right that's what we need to mention next question 
suggest why it is necessary to cool the mixture before filtering in step 9. This is the hard one. I was talking about this, about step 9. So now, after this, what has happened after this? Basically, we have added some HCl to neutralize the base and acidify the salt to get benzoic acid. Now we are going to filter this mixture. So we get a solid here after adding it to red. So we are going to filter this mixture. The solid residue is going to be stuck over here. And the remaining things like, you know, uh, some the excess HCl, then excess methanol, they will pass through the filter paper and will go down as the filtrate. Now, uh, it's not the pure product yet because some HCl, some methanol might still stick to the surface of my benzoic acid precipitate in the residue, okay? So what do we need to do? We need to purify the benzoic acid by recrystallization from hot water. So how are we doing this? They have mentioned that the actual question is, what is the question? We have to focus here. Uh, why is it necessary to cool the mixture before filtering in step 9? This is really important. Purify the benzoic acid by recrystallization from hot water. So what you're going to do is, now you're going to transfer this solid residue in some hot H2O. Okay? And yeah, it is still a precipitate, right? It is still a precipitate. It's not going to dissolve in H2O. But we use this hot water to mainly get rid of any impurities that might be stuck to the surface of the precipitate. And then, what am I going to do? I am going to heat this. This water is hot in the first place. But we need to, the question is why are we going to allow it to become cool before filtering? So, essentially the main thing is, you guys know from lattice enthalpy that for anything to be soluble, the del H sol must be exothermic. For anything to be soluble, del H sol must be exothermic. This is the main point that you guys need to know. So, since this is insoluble, the del H sol is actually endothermic, okay? Our salt, methyl our salt, benzoic acid, my bad. So we can say that the forward reaction for this one, the forward reaction for this is an endothermic reaction. So think about it. If the temperature remains high, I'm gonna show you two scenarios, okay? one for 80 degrees celsius the other for maybe 25 degrees celsius now if it remains hot do you guys know what's going to happen if you increase temperature you know that for an endothermic reaction the equilibrium shifts to the right hand side so what does that mean our salt would be more soluble in that hot solution for example if I do filter this solution over here, the one with 80 degrees Celsius, after filtering, I might end up with 2 grams of salt. But if I filter the one at after I let it cool to 25 degrees Celsius, I'm going to get a residue here as well, but the, uh, you know, the mass of the solid will be maybe 2.2 grams. So what does that mean? At a lower temperature, we are ending up with higher precipitate because as temperature increases the equilibrium shifts to the right and the solubility of the salt benzoic acid is higher at high temperature but it is lower at low temperature at room temperature that is why we'll get more precipitate so that is exactly what we need to say after purifying the benzoic acid by recrystallization from hot water before filtering, we need to ensure that it cools to room temperature, then filter and dry and record the mass obtained. Okay.
So check this out, see if you guys get it. Benzoic acid is less soluble in cold water. Or you could say that benzoic acid is more soluble in hot water. So it has to be cooled before filtering. Okay. I gave you all the details. Why? Now, next question. Pure benzoic acid has a melting point of 122. The product made by student 1 has a melting point of 119. The student suggests the melting point of the product was lower than expected because it contains some water. This is possible. <laughs> maybe it was not dried properly. So since it was not dried properly, maybe the melting point appeared lower than uh, the actual one. Okay. Since it was not dried properly, some water was some water was stuck or there was water of crystallization with the solid or something. Some water was stuck on the surface. As a result, the melting point has appeared lower than the actual one. So how would we confirm that it has been completely dried? We could reheat it and reweigh it until a constant mass has been obtained. That's the important part, okay? So dry the precipitate or heat it and <coughs> dry and heat dry using an air blower air dryer or oven and reweigh until constant mess is obtained is this fine next moving on Calculate the mass of benzoic acid that can be formed from 1.242 grams of methyl benzoid. I already did the math above. I'll show you again. <clears throat> so the moles of methyl benzoate is, I taught you, 1.242 divided by its MR 136. 1.242 over here, 1.242 divided by the MR. And since it's the limiting reagent, I'm going to proceed with the value itself. So the moles of benzoic acid will also be the same since methyl benzoate is the limiting reagent. And now to find out the maximum mass of benzoic acid, what can we do? We know that mass is equal to moles into MR and we have the MR of benzoic acid at 122. So I'm just going to multiply it with 122 over here and we are going to get 1.11 grams. I did this beforehand. Okay, so um, this is the working. The moles of methyl benzoate and sodium benzoate is the same as well as benzoic acid is the same and since it's the limiting reagent i proceeded with that and afterwards i just multiplied with the mr of benzoic acid to find out the final mass okay finally they want us to figure out the product yield percentage yield so it states that we get 0.825 grams of benzoic acid from 1.242 grams of methyl benzoate. Rookies would just do this 0.825 by 1.242 into 100, but that's wrong. You can only compare benzoic acid with another mass of benzoic acid. We have 1.242 grams of methyl benzoate from the first place, right? So what has changed? Our theoretical yield was 1.11 grams of benzoic acid. But how much have we got in real life? 0.825. So what is the yield? The actual value, 0.825, by the theoretical value, 1.11 times 100%, which gives you a value of 74%. All right. Let's move on to question number two. Important question. This question is uh, related to equilibria. Yeah. Pure water dissociates according to this equation. We know that the equilibrium constant for the dissociation of H2O is kw or called it is called the ionic product of water and this is an endothermic process since bonds are being broken so at 25 degrees celsius uh, the value is this and the ph of water is 7 but at 35 degrees celsius the ph is 6.84 it decreased so as you increase temperature ph decreases and i want to teach you something else since it's an endothermic reaction, you learned this in AS that Kp, Kc, Kw, Ka, K, 
uh, B, all of these are equilibrium constants and they are only affected by temperature, right? So if it's an endothermic reaction, it is proportional with temperature. If it's an exothermic reaction, then it's inversely proportional with temperature. Okay, that is something that you need to know. So since it's an endothermic reaction, according to my theory, I know that as temperature increases, the value of Kw is also supposed to increase. And why is pH decreasing? I can teach you why. It's an endothermic reaction, so if you increase temperature, the equilibrium will shift to the right-hand side. So we will get an increase in the concentration of H+, and we know that pH equals to minus log base 10 H+. And as this value increases, the value becomes more negative. Alright. So let's do the math. Find the pH or the hydrogen ion concentration at 45 degrees Celsius. So as you can see, I have drawn the line, construction line. At 45 degrees Celsius, the pH is 6.70. Okay. So. If we input this over here, 6.70 is equal to minus log H plus equals. So minus 6.70 is equal to log h plus equals concentration so we get rid of the log by transferring the log base 10 so it turns into 10 to the power minus 6.70 and we get a final answer of 1.995 into 10 power minus 7 or 2.00 into 10 power minus 7 both work but please be sure to round it off all right now calculate the value of kw for water at 45 degrees so i'm going to teach you something we know that in equilibrium suppose if we had 100 molecules of this initial and 0 of each, if it dissociated to form 60 molecules of water, we would get 40 of each, right? So we can say that the concentration of H plus and OH minus are the same. So since I have the concentration, since I have the concentration of H plus, We also have indirectly have the concentration of OH minus. So KW is equal to this into that. So that's basically 1.995 into 10 power minus 7 whole square. So we end up with 3.98 into 10 power minus 14. Now they asked us the relationship between KW and water. As you can see at 25 degrees Celsius, it was 1 into 10 power minus 14. At 35 degrees Celsius, it's 3.98 into 10 power minus 14. So what has happened? As temperature has increased, the value of KW has also increased, which indicates that it is in fact an endothermic reaction. Okay, this is what you needed to state. Okay, moving on to the table now. As you can see, I filled up the table beforehand. So the first one is 1 by temperature in Kelvin, where we have to give the answers to three significant figures in standard form. And we need to record log Kw, where we have to give the answer to two decimal places. Okay, so please check with the table that I have drawn here. And tell me if you have any queries. This is extremely important. Okay, let's move on to the next part. Now we are asked to plot a graph of log kw against 1 by t. So as you can see, I've plotted it over here. These are the points if you guys want to check. So for example, I'll teach you, uh, let's start from the left. At minus 12.84, it's 2.92 into 10 power minus 3. So 2.92, what does that mean? Two boxes from 2.9 onwards, 2.92 into 10 power minus 3, and it is to minus 12.84. So where is that minus 12? This is minus 12.8, so this is minus 12.9. So each box in between is worth 0.2. So this is minus 12.82, minus 12.84, and so on. So just take a look at all the uh, points. I'll zoom in for you guys. You can match with me. There aren't solutions to the graph for paper five, right? So these videos are very helpful for you guys, as far as I know. These are the other points. I want to show you a complicated point, like maybe this one. 3.30, 13.83. Okay, so 3.30 and 13.83. What does that mean? This is minus 13.8. So this is minus 13.2 and minus 13, sorry, 13.82 and 13.84 so 13.83 should be in between 13.82 and 84 yeah 
that's how it works so these are the other points you can just pause the video take a look at the graph and all the points and just plot them so now I'm going to show you the line the line of best fit according to me so this is how I picked it I made it pass through the second point on the left it passes to the third and fourth as well it goes below the fifth one through the sixth one but above the seventh one since it goes below one point and above another point I'd say that this is the line of best fit also one other thing this point is clearly an anomaly which they asked us to uh, circle right the one you consider to be most anomalous and they wanted to suggest they wanted us to suggest one reason why it was an anomaly and assume that there was no error in determining kw so kw has been determined correctly so the problem is not on the y-axis rather the problem is on the x-axis okay so according to this if we check the problem in the x-axis it is not supposed to be at 2.92 rather if I keep the y-axis the same, it is supposed to be somewhere over here, maybe at 2.96. The correct answer should have been 2.96. Okay. So let's see what can be done. If you backtrack, okay, you know that the correct answer is supposed to be 2.96 in 10 power minus 3 of 1 by t. You can actually solve this to find out the correct temperature of 337. So the correct temperature should have been 337, but it has been recorded as 343, which is why the error has occurred. So basically what has happened is my value over here, all right, my value over here, what is the reason for the anomalous point the ph okay the ph we calculate the ph right this is how we did the math we calculate the ph so the ph was actually recorded at a lower temperature than 343 uh, which is specifically 337 according to my graph okay the ph was actually recorded at a lower temperature than 343 which gives us the value of Ka of minus 12.84, which should have coincided with something like 2.96. However, since in the table, I have recorded it as 343, which is why I'm getting a value like this, okay? So in real life, the temperature was a bit lower than 343, which is why I got a value of this. This Kw was 12.84. So in real life, it should have been over here. Okay, it should have been over here, but, or basically, uh, this is the correct value itself. Since they said that there was no problem in finding out the value of Kw, so we found out the pH properly, we calculated Kw properly. So what does that mean? That this point is fine. But it's just that in the table, we have recorded it as a wrong value. The temperature has been recorded as 343, but it should have been recorded as 337. Then, according to the calculation, the point would have been over here, okay? That is why it is appearing as an anomaly. Hopefully, I could clarify things. But this was rather easy because they left out one axis. We had to explain in terms of temperature only. Moving on, you could also think of it this way. Uh, the value should have been larger. The value of 1 by t should have been larger. So what should happen to the value of t? It should be less, right? Because if denominator decreases, the value of the whole fraction increases. Okay. Now we are asked to find out the gradient, writing down the coordinates. So always remember to draw the dotted triangle, which must exceed at least 50% of your graph. And yes, you can use coordinates that your line has passed through, given that uh, your line has passed through them, right? careful so for example I couldn't use this point over here wait I couldn't use this point over here so anyway I just picked two random values um, I went for this over here 3.49 at 3.49 it's of minus 14.4 3.49 into 10 power minus 3 of course and over here it is uh, at 3.08 it's 13.2 yeah 3.08 into 10 power minus 3 and 13.2 minus 13.2 so 3.08 into 10 power minus 3 minus 13.2 and 3.49 into 10 power minus 3 minus 14.4 okay so I calculated the gradient according accordingly I'm gonna do it again plus 14.4 
0.08 minus 3.49 into 10 to the power minus 3. Yeah, I get a value of minus 2926.82. Always remember in chemistry, okay, look at our data. They're all three significant figures. So uh, always calculate the gradient to three significant figures, okay? Please do not mess this up. So if I round this off, it's going to be minus 2930, okay? Minus 2926.82. Your answer should be around this value. Now for the final part, this is the relationship between log kW and 1 by t. So I'm going to try to rearrange it to the form y is equal to mx plus c, just like physics p5. So we have log kW on the y-axis and 1 by t on the x-axis. Okay, so log kW on the y-axis and 1 by t on the x-axis. So here we are left with minus del h divided by 2.303 rt plus a constant. So we can actually equate this with our gradient, with my particular gradient, minus 2930. That is exactly what I've done. I got rid of the minus sign. I performed cross multiplication, 2930 into 2.303. And the uh, unit of R is the most important. It is 8.31 joules per Kelvin per mole. We need the answer in kilojoule per mole. But if you multiply it, you're going to get the answer in joules per mole. So afterwards, please do divide it by 1000 to convert it to kilojoule per mole. That is the most important point that you guys must not forget to consider. Okay? So just keep this in mind and you'll be good to go. Alright guys, that is it for the paper. Hope you like the content. Please do like the video if this helped you and remember to subscribe to the channel. I am planning to solve the other papers for Chemistry P5 and Chemistry P4 soon. I know your A-levels is coming up for the October November session, so please do keep an eye on the channel. Also do uh, consider supporting me on Patreon because uh, you get a priority for question paper solving requests uh, where I can solve the questions for you beforehand and you get access to them on my Patreon. Uh, just a quick shout out for my $15 patrons for the month. Shout out to Dewa, Luna, and Sean. Anyway guys, that's been it for this video. I'm going to link the paper for um, May June 2023 5 one up here and the paper for February March 2023 5 two down here and the playlist for Chemistry P5 up here and remember to subscribe to the channel. See you guys. Bye bye.